good time of worship this morning, and uh, we continue now as we um, turn into God's Word and look at His at what He has to show us this morning. Uh, we're going to have Kevin Madden come shortly here. Kevin and Alicia and Noah and Taylor are here this morning. Kevin is uh, uh, works for us. He's he's one of our employees. As a uh, um, a member of the Canadian National Baptist Convention. He's on staff there working in Alberta, and I'm sure he'll tell you a little bit more exactly where all he covers. I'm not sure all the area he covers, but he has a vast, vast area of, of uh, ministry. And uh, he's going to share with us, preach, preach for us this morning, and just to give us a little bit of idea of what he does. And, uh, you know, I, I know that we, it's just, I thought it was just a good opportunity for you to understand. We talked about a couple weeks ago about stewardship and how we give and how part of our money goes to the Quaffer program. Well, that's how Kevin and Alicia are supported and uh, through our giving to the Quaffer program. So I thought it would be good to have an opportunity to have him come and to um, speak to us this morning and to share with us what God's place upon his heart. And Alicia also is going to share this morning. Some of you who are students and maybe, I don't know if it's just, just students necessarily, right? Is it could be more than that. You'll let us know too, right? Um, I, I have all, all the details. That's why I wanted them to come. And uh, she's going to share about Current and uh, some opportunities that are available to you um, this morning as well. So uh, I've known them for quite a while now, I guess. They came to Canada when Ardell and I were pastoring in Salmon Arm, B.C., um, Kevin came to Kamloops then to be an associate pastor there with uh, Mel Blackaby at uh, Hillcrest. I'm trying to think his name's changed, right? I had to think back to what the name was. And then they were, uh, before they came to work for us on the uh, convention, he was uh, past. they were pastoring. I say he, I always say they, so I say Ardell and I were pastoring. Because it's a team, right? We're, we work together as couples. But they were pastoring in Kamloops at Potter's House. And uh, I knew it was really hard for them to leave. But I know that God's blessing them in the ministry that they are doing now. And that's Kevin to come down and share with us. So it's good to be with you this morning. And uh, it is great to be reconnected with some, I would say old friends, but I don't want to offend anybody. <laughs> we are getting older. Uh, but it's just great how God has reconnected us with this and Ardell and their family. And um, we've, uh, we served together for a while in the same region of BC. And, had some sweet times there together, and uh, it's neat how the Lord has allowed our paths to cross again. And, uh, our roles have changed, and our ministries have taken different uh, directions, but uh, still doing uh, great work with the same uh, denomination that we're all a part of, and such a wonderful family, and uh, such a wonderful partnership that we have in the kingdom. And so I wanted to just uh, give you a little bit of an idea of, um, practically speaking, what your cooperative program giving, and in particular your giving to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering, those funds have a direct impact on, on me and my ministry and allow me to do what God has, uh, has called me to do at this time and given me the opportunity to be involved in. And so sometimes we, um, we contribute to these offerings and we know that they help with missionaries uh, in 120 countries around the world. And the largest evangelical mission force that is uh, in the world uh, that's a part of this Southern Baptist Convention that we're in close connection with. And over 5,000 of those missionaries are right here in North America. So we've uh, left uh, church planting and pastoring a church over in uh, Kelowna area and took a position with our Canadian uh, National Baptist Convention. But those funds come from our North American Mission Board. Uh, all the churches in North America, the Southern Baptist churches, including Canada, contribute to this thing we call the Cooperative Program. And uh, that program allows the funding for many missionaries and many uh, ministries that happen throughout North America. And so my role in particular is uh, a part of the church planting or starting component of our convention. And I work to help was I not wrong? I don't And so my region in particular where I help to facilitate church planting and to recruit church planters and to help churches that want to start new works is Alberta, uh, BC except for the Vancouver region, so everything except for the greater Vancouver area, and then the Yukon and Northwest Territories. 
And so, you know, we have a small convention here in Canada. We're young in many respects, uh, with a great vision for a thousand churches by 2020. Uh, right now, we have about 280 churches, and so we have a long way to go to reach that goal. But when we first moved to Canada, we had about 120. Uh, so there's been a lot of growth, and uh, some very exciting things are happening, especially in the area of, of church planting. Um, in particular, God is at work in the Calgary area. Uh, seems things kind of come in waves at different times, and God has brought some things together in Calgary where a number of different groups are starting. A new Romanian church, a new Japanese uh, church, uh, a new, our very first um, Messianic Jewish congregation to reach the Jewish community in Calgary. And I, we believe that's our first across Canada. I know that your church hosts uh, a congregation that, that meets at another time, but this would be a first uh, focused ministry to reach uh, a growing Jewish community that's in the Calgary area. Um, and a Haitian church that uh, very excitedly got brought some things together. There's a number of Haitians have been relocating to Calgary because of the economy and moving from Eastern Canada and different parts of North America and also from Haiti, but many times they're already in the country or uh, and they've made Calgary their home, and so we have our first Haitian congregation, uh, and I just had an ordination service for their pastor. Uh, his name, by the way, always makes me laugh. His name is Gimme Baloney. <laughs> and so he didn't even know that in English that kind of means something a little different, you know, like give me some baloney. Um, but uh, I always have to laugh when I think of his name. It brings a smile to my face, and he's just a joy-filled, a very passionate Christian who's actually a physician uh, and was trained in Haiti and had to uh, leave the country due to unrest and, and a lot of the environment there. He felt that his family was not safe and so they made their home in Canada and he's starting his medical training all over again. He's in nursing school. He has to get his credentials back to be a physician. Um, but his passion is pastoring and uh, it's just a joy to work with leaders like this who have the call of God in their lives, and because of our giving and because we value church planting and the mission of God, I have the ability to come and to help resource and encourage and uh, to, to bless them and to help them with training and to encourage their families, and uh, all of that is made available because uh, I have been able to serve as your missionary uh, here in Canada. So thank you for your partnership, and thanks for the work that, uh, that we're able to do together. And just especially to thank you for your giving to the cooperative program and to the Annie Armstrong Easter offering. Those funds go directly to missionaries and uh, are a huge resource for us as we try to, to work together to, to bring God's kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. So my burden this morning as I come to share a bit about North America and maybe a heart for missions, um, I, I really try to be positive and really look for the good things that God is doing, and God is at work, no doubt about it. Um, but there's also a tremendous burden when we begin to realize the spiritual condition of North America, and in particular the church. Um, as much as we can identify some good things that God is doing, and we all have testimonies and can thank God for His blessings, the work of the kingdom is not going so well in North America, especially compared to other places in the world where Christianity is growing and the church is getting stronger and the population of lostness is diminishing. That is not true in North America. The church is losing ground. So I, I wanted to share just a, a, a message that God has put on my heart about the priority of the kingdom of God. I believe that if we have the kingdom in its right perspective, that the church will take its proper place. But it really is important as we look at, at God's kingdom, and I've entitled this Becoming a Kingdom Community, and really that's another name in, in my heart for the church, a kingdom community. But I do believe that it's, it's very different than the mindset that we've acquired here in North America about being a church. And what does it mean to be a church and the way that we've defined it and the way that we 
um, are functioning, and what does it mean to be a true kingdom community? I believe if we can revisit these things and look uh, at the priority of Jesus and his teachings, that we'll find that there are some great differences between what we become as the church and what we value, and sometimes what we need to be as a true kingdom community. Now the two should go hand in hand, but obviously the biblical definition of church would be a kingdom community, but how have we evolved and become marginalized in our society and to a large extent uh, ineffective at carrying out the Great Commission? The lost population is increasing, not decreasing. More people are turning away from the church than we're bringing into the church, especially among your demographic, younger people. Now, it's a, a problem that the church has had uh, throughout history, and certainly modern history, uh, but because of the rise of secularism, and in a unique uh, opportunity that here in North America, the opportunity to do missions and to reach the world in many respects is easier than ever before in history because the world is at our doorstep. It used to be we had to go to other nations. Now the nations are here. Immigration and all that's happening in many of the cities, and it certainly is a part of the Canadian landscape, uh, the nations are here and can be reached without even having to go. As a matter of fact, our International Mission Board is uh, for the first time, appointing people group missionaries for people groups here in Canada, like Muslim populations in Vancouver and Toronto, where we have two full-time International Missionary board, Mission Board missionaries to reach the Muslims because they're easier to reach here in Canada than they are in their own countries. They're more receptive to the gospel here in North America. And in a large part, as is true within our own denomination, our ethnic works and our work with immigrants here and those that are not native Canadians is growing greater than our work among Anglos. And so the reality is the need is urgent. North America and the church in particular. It's not the problem with the lostness. The lostness is being lost. That's what lostness does. That's what unchurched people do. They, that's the morals they have. That we can't expect anything better from them. But the hope is that we as the church would truly understand what it means to be a kingdom community. And so let's look in the Gospels. As you look at the times that the kingdom is mentioned, we find that the kingdom, the word kingdom in that uh, Greek Aramaic term is mentioned over 120 times in the four Gospels. And yet the word church is only mentioned two times in the Gospels. Now obviously in Acts and the rest of the New Testament, the church is, is uh, identified and described and, and lived out. But the kingdom is the priority message of Jesus Christ. It is what he taught about. It's what he, the focus of his parables, the focus of his preaching, his teaching. Uh, his life, his heart, was motivated by the kingdom of God. And so what is the kingdom of God? Well, many theologians have written volumes of books on the kingdom of God because it is multidimensional and very complex. And yet there's a simplicity about it as well, which is often the case with the teachings of Jesus and some of the most deep spiritual truths. A child can understand it, and yet, someone with multiple PhDs who spends his life studying and examining the details of Scripture will never understand it. So, you and I can't figure that out, but that's the God we serve. So, it is possible for us to understand much more about the Kingdom of God. It's not such a vague mystery that only in the mind of Jesus and God Himself, it's something that He made a priority in His teaching and preaching and he desperately wants us to understand. And so the kingdom is, in its complexity, it's already present, but it also has a future expectation. It's often described as it's both now and not yet. So is it a political kingdom of freedom and justice? Many people believe that that's the definition of the kingdom of God. Or is it a personal kingdom 
of God's reign in our hearts and in our lives? Well, that too. Or perhaps it's a future kingdom which brings history to its end and where King Jesus reigns forever. Well, that sounds really good as well. The truth is that it's not any of these things completely, but yet it's all of these things and much more. The kingdom of God is certainly here, and Jesus proclaimed it and ushered it in, but yet it is not fully realized yet. And so maybe it's helpful to think about the kingdom of God with this illustration. At the end of World War II, there are two significant historical dates. Now the first date is called D-Day, and that's June the 6th, 1944. It's when the end of World War II was secured on the beaches of Normandy. But however, full surrender did not come, and the end to the fighting in Europe didn't come until May the 8th, 1945, which is called VE Day, Victory in Europe Day. So there was nearly a full year of fighting, shooting, casualties, which all took place between the time the victory was secured and when the victory was finally declared. So in a similar way, the kingdom of God came to our world through the person of Jesus Christ. His life, death, and resurrection secure victory over death. So the kingdom has come because Jesus has come. But it won't be fully realized until Jesus comes back. So the end is no longer in doubt. The war has been won. And yet there's still battles to be fought. There's still a kingdom to be advanced. We still have work to do until the day when Jesus returns. And before Jesus left this earth, he created the church to represent him, to be his body, to be his kingdom community. We find these, pra these phrases in 1 Peter 2.9. And I'll not say that, uh, as the scriptures will say, the tense is you are. I'll say we as the church. But the phrases in 1 Peter 2.9 are, we are a chosen people. We are a kingdom of priests. We're God's holy nation, His very own possession. And this is so that we can show others the goodness of God. For He called us out of His darkness into His marvelous light. We are a kingdom of priests. We are a kingdom community. So what do we do as this kingdom community? Well, the first thing is we need to understand the message of the kingdom. The message is the gospel. It is good news. And when the church struggles, when the kingdom community struggles with the message of the kingdom, then we're in trouble. Everything is questioned. If we don't understand our message and we don't uh, fully embrace the message of the kingdom, you know, what is the good news? What is this gospel that somehow identifies us as a church, as the kingdom, of, uh, a kingdom community? Well, the message of the kingdom is the message of salvation. It is the good news proclaimed by Jesus that he came to seek and to save those who are lost. The message of the kingdom is summed up in what we call the Great Commission, which we find in Matthew 28. We find in this scripture... It is so familiar to us. A description of what we need to be as kingdom people. And it says that Jesus came to them and he said, All authority has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Now this message of the kingdom, if we're not clear and understanding it and able to um, express it to others, then we find that the kingdom is, is going to struggle to come here on earth as it is in heaven. The kingdom and its advancement is going to be greatly limited. We can't wait for people to just somehow get it, for somehow people just to figure it out. Somehow on their own, they'll stumble upon the true meaning of the kingdom. It's not a mystery that somehow spiritual nomads, we just let people wander around and somehow they'll find it out as they 
uh, pursue truth or whatever the phrases we use today for everyone doing what is right in their own eyes. But the message was very much on the heart of Jesus Christ. Charles Spurgeon describes the importance of the kingdom message with this quote. He says, If sinners be damned, at least let them leap to hell over our bodies. If they will perish, let them perish with our arms around their knees. Let no one go there unwarned and unprayed for. You see, the message of the kingdom is ours to tell. We're left behind, I believe, for this very reason. In other words, why wouldn't we just go to heaven and be with God when we became Christians? If the end was that we're just to be with God in heaven and we've got a heavenly home, why did He let us linger and live another day if that's the end result? Because of the message of the kingdom. Because, as Charles Spurgeon is saying, if, if people are going to be damned to hell, at least let them leap over to hell over our bodies. You've heard the phrase, over my dead body? It's a phrase to signify, I'm not sure of the origin of it, but it comes to mind as you think of this, this uh, plea from Charles Spurgeon. In other words, let people go to hell over our dead bodies. They'll have to climb over us to get there. Our job is to make it difficult for people to get to hell. If not near impossible, because of our work and our prayers, and that we would even hold on to them by the knees, that no one would go there unwarned and unprayed for. The message of the kingdom is a warning. It's good news, but it's a warning that the reverse of the good news is bad news. The good news is that Jesus saves. The message is life and death. There is a message. But the message is only good news when it's accompanied by the work of the kingdom. We're a kingdom community so that we can show others the goodness of God. The same verse in, in 1 Peter tells us that the reason that we're a kingdom of priests is so that we can show others the goodness of God. So the work of the kingdom is transformation. It's God on display in and through us. So when the kingdom is real in us, it will affect change in our families, our friends, our communities and our nation. The work of the kingdom includes good deeds and working for what the Bible calls the good of the city. Every local church is to somehow embrace this concept of the work of the kingdom. What is the good of the city? There's a whole theology of that and understanding what is meant there in Jeremiah 29, 7. But in regard to the kingdom, it means the greater the rule and the reign of the king in our hearts and in our lives, the greater the manifestation of his kingdom. The more we get this message and the more we function as kingdom people, the more it's going to be revealed to a watching world. It will impact our city. It will affect the good of our city. A true kingdom community cannot be functioning under a bushel or without there being evidence and fruit to a watching world. Our gospel is sometimes canceled because of the way we live. I was watching a popular uh, evangelical leader, yet another one who has fallen prey to sin and to disgrace and was actually the president of the Evangelical Association of the United States. In, in some people's regard, he represented all believers for um, the U.S. And he fell into great moral failure. Now there's a story of grace and their marriage survived and I'm not here to, to judge. But what did that do to our message? What does my failure do to the message of the gospel? If we're to be an effective kingdom community, then our message is only as good as the work of the kingdom in our lives. And yes, there's lots of room for grace, but 
sometimes we use grace as just an excuse that we might do anything and let God mop up the mess and fix it. As I'm listening to this great man of God who was used of God in mighty ways and maybe in the future, there's no mopping up that mess. There's no changing the effect that it's going to have on many, many people who are going to move farther away from God because the message was not backed up by the work of God in his life. It's a critical time for us to live godly, holy lives, or our message will have no value. The world is already skeptical. They're already saying we're hypocrites, and they're seeing where we're falling, and yes, it's always going to be a part of our human condition, and grace needs to be a part of our message, but we also need to take seriously that for people to listen to this life-saving message, that our lives need to be lived in holiness. And to represent Christ well. For we are his ambassadors. So the kingdom assignment. This work of the kingdom. This great commission. Also involves the great commandment. To love the Lord with all our heart. Our soul. Our mind and our strength. You know that takes care of a lot. Of our lives. Really everything. It's boiled down into loving the Lord. With all our heart. Our soul. Our mind and our strength. Will that somehow keep us from sin? Well, with God's grace, and it won't be perfection, but if we love the Lord with all of our heart, our soul, and our mind, and our strength, how would that determine what steps we take, and what we do with our eyes, and what we look at, and where we go, and what we say, and how we live our lives? Absolutely. It would bring God's kingdom message to play in our lives. The work of the kingdom not only involves this working out of our salvation, but it also involves some practical ways that we reach out in our community. It's going to have an effect on our values. It includes a passion for the sanctity of human life as we seek the protection of the unborn, the disabled, and the elderly. There are values that we have that are kingdom values. It's a devotion to helping the poor. We cannot forsake the poor. God's Word says that that's a clear indication that we don't have the love of God in us because it's very much at the heart of Jesus Himself. A generosity to serve and to give ourselves away. A compassion that ministers to the sick. A sense of stewardship as we care for God's creation. All of these things are a part of a kingdom life. A love for justice for all people. You know, as we watch the world respond with compassion to the tragedy in Haiti. What an opportunity for the church to be a kingdom community. And it's happening. Many, many stories. Now, there's some that, you know, are, are not great stories. But what an opportunity for the world to see that the church not has the corner market on doing good deeds or providing funding, but in the message of the kingdom and what's important not just for this life but the life to come, we have an opportunity to bring the practical message of the kingdom as we do acts of kindness and help those who are in great suffering. So the work of the kingdom is practical. When I was a young uh, man in church, we had a group, a missions group for the guys called Royal Ambassadors. How many of you have ever heard of Royal Ambassadors? I think. The, the, the girls' group was Girls in Action, GAs. How many of you have ever heard of GAs? Okay, so we're striking out. Uh, these were, were missions organizations and programs for children to learn how to be missionaries, how to do missions, how to be a, a, a kingdom community. But I was thinking about the name Royal Ambassadors. It's exactly what we are. We're a kingdom of priests. We're ambassadors for Christ. We are royal ambassadors. We represent the king. And the work of the kingdom is to go about our lives representing him well. It means we are involved in our community and that we serve in the name of Jesus Christ. It's taking responsibility for the lostness around us. And I think the work of the kingdom requires we ask a couple of very difficult questions. One question is, what will it take to transform this community by the power of the gospel? Now, this is 
a different mindset and question oftentimes than the question we ask about what is it going to take to keep the doors open to the church? What is it going to take for us to maintain our programs? What is it going to take for us to offer services to those of us that are in the room, already in the kingdom? Now, I'm not saying we don't ask those questions, but I'm saying that to be a kingdom community, we also have to ask the question, what is it going to take to bring the gospel with power to our community? Because who else is going to ask that question? Who else is going to take responsibility for lostness in this community? Another question is, if our church ceased to exist today, if we left this building and this church was no more, would the community notice? Now, to be honest, I don't like these questions. I really don't like these questions when I'm a pastor of a church. You know, I can, I can pose these questions because I'm not leading a congregation, a local congregation right now, but these are not easy questions. The problem is when we stop asking them. When we stop asking these kind of questions, it means that we're not a kingdom community. We're a church by North American definition. And the church by North American definition is not getting the job done. It just isn't. If our prayer is to be the very prayer of Jesus Christ who said as he was asked, teach us how to pray. And he said, this is how you should pray. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. The kingdom. The final thing, as much as this message and this work of the kingdom is important, the power and the real focus for us, perhaps, is that the motivation of the kingdom is where it should be. With the right motivation, you find that the work and the words come easier. The motivation is the cross. The cross is our motivation to live as kingdom citizens. It is the symbol of the kingdom. The cross is the place where God's love meets our sin. It's that intersection where God is most perfectly demonstrating his love. We find in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 14, says in the scriptures that Christ's love compels us. Since we have reached this conclusion, if one died for all, then all died. And he died for all so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for the one who died for them and was raised. The cross is a motivation of love. For no greater love has any man than this than he would lay down his life for his friends. The cross is the Definitive end all discussion of the question, how much does God love me? Look at the cross. And the motivation for this kingdom community, this church that God is using in order to bring about his kingdom on earth, is to be the very cross of Jesus Christ. God is calling us to live a life driven intensely by the same love and grace that drove. Jesus to the cross. It reminds us that the love of God is the most powerful force in the universe. For God so loved the world that he gave his very own son. So as a kingdom community, we can preach the message and do the work, but without love, without the right motivation, it's all a lot of busyness and noise. That's what the scriptures say. Without love, without the motivation that motivated Jesus to give his very life, for God so loved the world. And as much as you think, well, that's so basic and elementary, the world is not seeing that motivation by the church. The world is seeing oftentimes a message that is devoid of love and devoid of compassion and devoid of the very essence of what drove Jesus to the cross. But we're right. We know what we believe and this is right and this is wrong. And yes, we can be right but do it without love and we somehow nullify our message. We 
can be bright and loving. Matter of fact, if we have the message but don't have the love, then the Bible says it's empty. The cross is the source of our motivation as we become crucified with Christ. So it's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. So the question for us today, the question for every church, especially in North America, is will we be motivated by the cross to share the message of the kingdom and to do the work of the kingdom? And as we consider those things, we wanted to share a few practical ways in addition to things that you're already doing, to maybe give you opportunities to be involved in this great kingdom work, this great commission. Um, one of the programs that we have that's been uh, very exciting to see how the Lord is growing it among young people, in particular students, is called Current Canada. And so I want to share with you just a, a video that's about a minute long that kind of overviews what this program is. And then I'll have my wife Alicia come and share a little bit of uh, how you can be involved in this. So take a look at this brief video on Current. Of uh, what Current is, uh, Current is a program that was started in 2001 by uh, some church planting leaders. And it's a specifically Canadian program for students and young adults to spend about six weeks serving across Canada. It's a fun, fun, amazing experience. And I would encourage you guys to consider, uh, if you've never spent a uh, summer doing a missions project, it's a great opportunity. Our, we're, this summer we're hoping to have 12 teams uh, serving from Vancouver to Prince Edward Island. And we try to have at least one Canadian student on each team. And uh, so uh, Kevin gave out the cards with the website. And um, you can visit the website. You can ask me any questions um, and uh, learn more about the program. Now, if any, are any of you Mandarin speaking? You do any of you have any Mandarin? Anybody? Last summer, we had a student uh, from Calgary who attends the University of Toronto, and she had it on her heart to, to work with people from mainland China. And so she, believe it or not, I didn't know this, but uh, Prince Edward Island is, is a main entry point for people coming from China. And we have a church there uh, in Charlottetown that's reaching a lot of Chinese People. And so she went and spent the summer. Um, it's, it's a very interesting situation because we have this Anglo church that has no one that speaks Mandarin or Cantonese, and they're reaching all these people, and they, they're serving meals and doing things, but they can't communicate with them effectively. And so she went and spent the summer there and had an amazing experience. We're sending a team of students preferably that have some abilities with Mandarin and or Cantonese, uh, for about five weeks, four, four and a half weeks, this summer to Prince Edward Island. And we're trying to recruit those students from Alberta. And so if you're interested, um, please let me know or let your pastor know and I can let you know more about that opportunity. But it's going to be a wonderful experience. She had the time of her life and is strongly considering going back to work on the team. So you'd be working with four other students from Alberta, Chinese students, working directly with new immigrants to Canada that are arriving in Charlottetown. Now, one of the beautiful parts of the partnership that we have that Kevin was talking about is that uh, often when you do missions and go on a missions program, it's very expensive. Um, but because of the partnership, there is funding available to cover most of your expenses, um, if not all of them, um, especially for our Canadian students. So please don't let the fear that it would be a really costly um, venture keep you from uh, letting me know or, or pursuing it. Um, with the funding that we have and the partnership we have with the North American Mission Board, and we actually have some camps in the U.S. 
that summer camps that run across the United States, and they take up an offering to help fund current and these different camps, youth camps across the U.S. And so we have funding for you to participate and would love, I would love to have at least one person in your church serve with current this summer. And so whether you're interested in an urban experience in Vancouver or Toronto or something more rural or working with immigrants, we have a variety of amazing opportunities for next summer. Just let me know if I can uh, help you further if you have questions. So the need is great, and I just want to encourage you as a church, uh, your partnership with Rayexa, I visited with uh, David Shedd in the Northwest Territories, and what a, a life-giving relationship you've had there, and what an encouragement as you guys have put these things into practice and gone beyond your own uh, community and looked at, at helping uh, in a very, as many of you know, a very needy place. Your Action 52 event is coming up, an exciting opportunity to bring people to Christ and to learn how to share uh, this message of the kingdom more effectively with those around us. And, uh, and then with current and certainly with church planting, one of the most, well, it is the most effective form of evangelism on the planet is planting new churches. Uh, I could do a whole message on that, but if you're interested in church planting, um, I would love to talk with you. We're going to be in Sunday school uh, the next hour, and we'd love to uh, hear any of your questions and help any way that we can. So just know that we're a resource. Anything that you want to do as uh, you go on mission, uh, please feel free to call us and let us know if we can. So thank you for the opportunity to share today.